Caleb, you did such a good job. That was so good. Do you know who else I love? I love as well, we've got quite a um, lot of younger girls coming along to band. I just love it. You have such energy, Pearl and Olive and Kenisha. And <laughs> Woo! Yeah. <laughs> um, so how are we all today? Good. Turn to your neighbour and say you get better looking every Sunday. Unless it's not true, because we're not allowed to lie. Today, um, I wanted to talk about um, identity. So, um, I think today is a very big, it's a very big question, you know, who am I? What's my identity? What's my identity in? And uh, with Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, which I'm sure we would all maybe be a little bit ashamed to see how much time we actually spend on these things. Um, it's this calculated life where you're basically saying like, look how great my life is, even if it's not true. Um, but yeah, you can portray that, you know, I've got this amazing, perfect, wonderful life. Um, but sometimes inside you feel like you're still not enough. You put your identity in these sort of things that fade so fast and they tend to cause a lot of hurt and pain when they go away. Um, but I was really thinking about, like, really think about who you are. Like, what, what does that mean? Like, if somebody asked you, what would you say? And I, I don't mean the fake you. I mean, not the person you pretend to be, the, the real you. You can't hide the real you from God. You can hide it from everyone else. But I mean, the nitty gritty, the, oh, hello, gorgeous. Well, you're thinking that is the ugliest outfit I've ever seen in my whole life. <laughs> That's, that, I've never done that. I've never, ever done that. Neither has anyone in this room. Um, no, but do you know what I mean? The, not the things you say, like the, at, who you really are on the inside, not who people perceive you to be or who you try to show other people that you are. Uh, many people today have no idea who they are. Even some of us who know God don't really know who we are. So I really thought about it. How, how would I answer this question? How would you answer this question? Like if someone came up to you and said, hi, who are you? What would you say? I go, hi, I'm Nikki. And you'd probably say, you wouldn't say, hi, I'm Nikki, but you would say, hi, I'm whatever your name is. Um, but then I was thinking like, yeah, that's what people call me. That's, you know, my name that my mum gave me. But is that, that's not who I really am. Like, yeah, that's my name, but that's not who I am. Then after that, I thought, okay, well, maybe like I would say, oh, I'm, you know, a teacher or a hairdresser or a singer or whatever you do. Then I was like, yeah, that's what you do. But is that who, really who you are? Um, like that could change at any moment. So sure, that can't be who you are. And then we would maybe say things like, you know, I'm a sister, I'm a wife, I'm a friend, I'm a brother, I'm a husband, whatever it is. Um, yeah, that's who you are to other people. But is that who you really are? Um, you know, so ask yourself, what, what's my identity? Is, is it man, woman, white, black, Scottish, English, SNP supporter, Labour supporter? Is, is that it? Is that who I am? Is that where I get my identity? I really thought about it and I came to the conclusion, I don't want to be my job. I don't want to be the clothes I wear or the country I'm from because as God's creation, we're all so much more than that. We're not just a, you know, a car, a house, a last name. Like we're so much more than that. Yeah, these are things that can impact how we behave and they can impact how we think, but can we really be so tightly defined to one small category? We often talk about kingdom culture, which is a culture we follow under God, which isn't the culture of like our family home or the country we're from. But in God's kingdom, we all fall under the same category. In God's kingdom, we're all a child of God. So you're a son of God or a daughter of God. That is who you really are when you accept Christ into your life, not all the other things. Um, I want to read from Matthew 3 verse 13 to Matthew 4 verse 11. I know it's quite a chunk, so try and stay with me. Um, so verse 13 says, should, yeah, there it is. Whoa, that was fast. Um, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me. But Jesus answered, let it be so now for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he contested. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved with whom I am well pleased. 
Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on a pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him on the high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Now, my favorite bit of that scripture is a bit where it says um, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and he was famished. I think if I fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, I'd be dead. Um, but anyway, so in that scripture, there is a lot of use of the word if. And if can be a really horrible word. I mean, it's only small. It doesn't seem like it can have that much power. But um, when you use it with the right words, it can really, really tear you down. You know, questions like what if God doesn't forgive you? What if it doesn't apply to you? If only you were better, then God might love you. Um, the devil loves to use the word if because it plants a seed of doubt. It's not certain, it's just mm, if you really think about it, is that true? It's not a, that's not definitely true, that's not true. No, no, it's not. It's just planting a seed of doubt so that you start to think, mm, actually, yeah, that, that could be true. Um, but when the devil brings uncertainty, how do you get confidence? So today I'm going to ask a few questions. I'm going to ask five questions. I know, five, it's a lot. Um, I'm going to ask some questions. And question one is, how do I get confidence? So the devil um, is the father of lies and deceit, and he places doubt and confusion into people. But God bring, doesn't bring a spirit of confusion, but a spirit of peace. Be careful of the word if. If you are the son of God, when the devil wants to tempt you, the first thing he'll attack is your identity. If you are the son of God, prove it. You're not the son of God. Well, if you're, so, if you're the son of God and you're so hungry, just make yourself some food. Like, obviously. Like, who do you think you are? Prove it. I don't believe you. Um, and we have to watch that we are not manipulated like that by the devil because the devil knows scripture too and he'll twist the truth to lead you into temptation. The tempter will say things like, you know you want to and it is just one time be fine. God will forgive you anyway. It says so in the Bible, God will forgive you. So it's fine. Just do it. And yeah, it does say God will forgive you, but it doesn't say you should just go out and do whatever you want and sin when you know it's sin just because God will forgive you. So it's don't let Satan use the scriptures twisted to make you do the wrong thing. We know right from wrong and don't allow yourself to be manipulated to do the thing that doesn't line up with God's word. Be confident enough in the scriptures so that when the devil tries to use them to you, you can just throw them back in his face. When the devil talks, talk back. My, yeah, my whole life I've been kind of told to not talk back. <laughs> um, and if anyone, you know, people living at home with their parents and stuff, I, oh, I hate it. Don't talk back. Mm -mm. But this is the one time you are allowed to talk back, so do it. You're allowed to talk back to the devil. When the devil talks, tell him to shut up. When he reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. When the devil says, who do you think you are? Say, I know who I am. I'm a child of God. Jesus' response was, it is written. That's it. He spoke the words of God. He didn't do a big incredible display of power to put Satan in his place to say, I am God, told you. I am the son of God. Proved it. Why did they not do that? Why did they not prove himself? Well, Jesus didn't need to prove who he was because he knew who he was. When you know who you are, you're seated in your authority, confident. We don't have to make a song and dance about everything we are to make people believe it. You know what I mean? Prove to people who we are. When you know who you are, you don't flap around panicking, hoping that people will say nice things to you so that you believe them about yourself because you know who you are. You are seated in your identity. 
When you are seated, it portrays power. When a king or queen is crowned, they are seated in their authority. Where is Jesus? Sitting at the right hand of the Father, seated in his authority. Confidence is when you know who you are enough to be a servant. In Luke 22, 24, it says, the disciples had an argument over who was the greatest. I love that. Imagine if we all went to lunch this afternoon and we were all arguing over who was the best. <laughs> I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. Um, and, um, so yeah, they're all kind of arguing over I'm the best. No, I'm the best. And Jesus' response to this is, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it should be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank. And the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here, for I am among you as one who serves. Jesus knew who he was. He knew his status. He knew his status as the son of Almighty God. And he was so confident in it that he didn't have to be served. He was there to serve. So that's how we become confident, by knowing exactly who we are, exactly who God's told us to be. But if we want to be confident in our, in our identity, we need to know what our identity is. So question two is, who am I? Yeah, who am I? Who are you? I'm just going to tell you who you are. You are God's daughter. You are God's son if you have accepted Christ as your father. Simple as that. But think about what it really means to be someone's son or someone's daughter. You know, the enemy hates your status as a son because he's not one. And that's why he attacks it. And that's why we have to guard it. And I don't think we realize the power of that position, the position of a son or a daughter. Does anyone in this room have a son or daughter? Yeah, quite a lot of people, yes. Is there anything that you wouldn't do to protect your son or your daughter? No, probably not. You would do anything to protect them. Why? because they have a really nice house or because they have a really good job or because they've done really amazing things. No, you love them because they're your child. Your children carry not only your DNA, but your legacy. What you do, what you do they can take even further and pass on to the next generation. Back in that scripture we read, um, Jesus gets baptized and the scripture says, a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. I just love that. You know, he's just like, son, I'm so proud of you. I just love you so much. And what had Jesus done to achieve or earn God's love at this point? Nothing. He hadn't healed anyone. He hadn't raised anyone from the dead. He hadn't opened any blind eyes yet. But because he was God's son, he had immediate status. No matter what, your sta no matter what you do, your status as God's child doesn't change. And that's good or bad. You don't have to try to be anything you're not because God's already given you your identity. I'm a daughter of God. You're a son of God. So because you're God's child, when someone messes with you, they have to answer to your dad. This means when we speak, things have to change because our dad has power, not because of who I am, but because of my dad, I have status. So who am I? Who are you? You are a child of God. Question three, how was I made? I think a lot of people think that they're maybe just here by chance or maybe by accident. Um, but no, you were carefully designed and that's why you're not like anyone else. Well, to find out how we were made, we need to go to Genesis. So Genesis 3, it says, and God said. Genesis 6, and God said. And Genesis 9, and God said. Verse 11, and God said. Verse 14, and God said. And verse 20, and God said. So God made everything with the power of his words. Everything he spoke to brought forth the thing he wanted it to bring forward. That's why there's a lot of power in our self-talk, and that's why it's important to remind ourselves of who we really are. When God was creating the universe, he was very precise about what he wanted. He decided what he wanted, he decided why he wanted it, and then he decided what he wanted it made out of. Whatever, God's, whatever God said to what he spoke to came out of what he spoke to exactly what he said. Write that down on your neighbor's arm four times. Whatever God said to what he spoke to came out of what he spoke to exactly how he said. When God wanted the trees, he spoke to the earth. So trees came out of the earth and the trees are made from the earth. 
when he wanted plants, he spoke to the dirt. So the plants came out of the dirt and the plants are made from dirt. When he wanted fish, he spoke to the water and out of the water came the fish and the fish are made from water. And when they die, they go back to water. Whatever God speaks to makes out of itself what he says. All right, is that we follow on? Okay. Everything needs to stay attached to where it came from or it dies. If you take a fish out of water, it dies. When you take a plant out of the ground, it dies because it's not attached to its source of life. When he wanted to make man, he spoke to himself. And out of God, which is spirit, came spirit. We don't have a spirit. We are a spirit. That's how we were made, directly from the image of God. When you are disconnected from your life source, you begin to die. Maybe not straight away. You might look okay on the outside for a little bit. But on the inside, you're dying. Look at flowers. When you cut them, they look really pretty for a couple of days, but they are dying because they've been disconnected from their source of life. And this is what happens when we have no relationship to God. We might look okay on the outside for a while, but we're, we're not connected to our source of life and we can't grow. Um, you were made in God's image, so you have to stay connected to him, not only to thrive, but to survive. So that's how you were made. You were made in God's image. Question four, what is my worth? It genuinely makes me so upset when I see people who have no self-worth, when they think they are utterly worthless and just a waste of space. Um, well, God wouldn't let you waste a seat in here if he didn't love you, if you weren't worth anything. You wouldn't be here if you weren't worth anything. You'd be gone already. Um, and you know, you you don't tell God that you're worthless. Are you God? No. He tells you you are worth something. And what you think is quite irrelevant, to be honest. You're not God. You don't tell him who's worth things. He tells you. And he tells you you are worth a lot. You know, people turn to drinking and drugs and toxic relationships because they don't think they deserve any better. They think, well, this is, this is it. I don't really deserve much more than that. So this will do me. But to God, you're not worthless. You're priceless. And there's a few things that make things more valuable. Things are more valuable by who owns them. So if I sell these shoes, they're not going to sell for very much because they're just old, smelly shoes. Um, no one's going to want to buy them. But like if Messi or Ronaldo or something are selling a pair of shoes, people would lose their minds and be like, oh my gosh, I have to buy these shoes for like millions of pounds. Why? Not because they're particularly better shoes or because they do different things, but because of who owns them. The owner gives value. So who owns you? Well, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, God owns you. But ultimately, something is worth how much you're willing to pay for it. I can tell you exactly how much everything you own is worth your house, your car, your watch. It's worth whatever someone is willing to pay for it. And Jesus paid the absolute highest price ever paid for you. That is where your value comes from, the price paid for you, not how talented you are, not how well you've done, not how much you have, how much you were paid for. You were paid for with money can't even describe, it couldn't even value it ever, how much was paid for you. But Satan will try to compare you, compare you to other people make you think things like, you know, look at them. They're just so much better than you. God just must love them more. You know, look how pretty they are. Look how accomplished they are. They just must be so much more valuable to God than little old you. Um, and when you listen to that, it becomes jealousy. We want what someone else has, which means we're not happy with what God has given us. And we strive to be someone that God has not called us to be. And then we have an identity crisis because we're trying to be someone that we're not. And when it's not working, we don't know why. So you have to do what God has given you to do and you'll be happy and fulfilled. You will never achieve that if you try to be someone that God has not asked you to be when you try to be what God has asked someone else to be. When you know who you are in Christ, you will allow other people to be who they are in Christ. If you don't know who you are, you will automatically try to hold other people back so they don't look better than you in the eyes of either God or the world. So we must realize that you are valued by God 
and that you are completely unique. What God has asked you to do, he's not asked anyone else to do. You're not like anyone else and you're not meant to be. Question five, why me? Why would God choose me? I think a lot of people get so caught up in this, you know, why me, little old me? Um, but you know, he, he did choose you and he chose me and he made us the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ, made justified. You know, we sang that song earlier, made justified. We, we're made justified, but do we get justice? Do we get what we deserve? Well, let me ask you another question. Um, do you think you're a good person? It's not a trick question. Um, if someone came up to me and said, do you think you're a good person? I'd probably say yes. But well, I'm not a bad person, so I must be good. Um, but I saw this video and it asked, I'm not gonna go through them all, but it went through a few questions and it made me think, am I really a good person? So you don't have to answer these out loud, but has anyone in this room ever told a lie? Ever? What's someone who tells lies called? A liar. Have you ever stolen anything in your lifetime? What's someone who steals called? A thief. I asked my mum yesterday if I'd stolen anything ever so I could use it in my preach. Um, but I stole a ball when I was three. She made me take it back. Um, so it probably wasn't that good if I got caught. Um, where am I? Oh, have you ever used God's name in vain? That's called blasphemy. The Bible says if you look at a woman and lust for her, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. Have you ever looked at anyone with lust? This is just four of the ten commandments or commandments in the Bible. And so far in this room, based on your own confession, you're either a liar, a thief, a blasphemer, or an adulterer at heart, or all four. And that's based on your own confession. In a court of law, do you think you would be found guilty or not guilty for your crimes based on the fact you've just confessed? Um, well, I think we would be found guilty because we are. Every single one of us in this room has broken the laws of God, which makes us all sinners, and the wages of sin is death. Now, we would agree when someone's committed a crime, the judge should give them a fitting punishment for that crime. There's this new... Um, thing out on TV and it's like these prisons in Norway or something and the prisoners just do whatever they want. Yeah, yeah, just live in my wee house and, you know, mow my lawn or whatever. And everyone's raging about it. Everyone's like, what? Like, no, you need to pay for what you've done. Like, we would all agree that, like, you know, when someone's committed a crime, we want them to pay for it. We want them to have some sort of punishment for that crime because there's a law and the law has to be followed. Well, we were in a court with overwhelming evidence brought against us, this was all true, um, brought to the judge by the devil, by the world. And you know how the devil loves to tempt you? He loves to tempt you, but he also loves to tell, remind you and remind God of everything that you've done wrong. He wants to try and throw it around, be like, look at you, got you, you dirty low sinner. I'm going to show the judge exactly who you are. Like, who do you think you are? Like, I'm going to make sure that like you get what you deserve. Um, but the one thing that the devil forgets is that the judge is your dad. The defense attorney is your big brother. And when all the evidence is stacked against you and you've been caught on camera, the jury knows you've done it. Like you are in trouble. It's not looking good at all. But then Jesus, your big brother, who's completely holy, never sinned ever in his whole life, only ever loved and looked after you, says, your honor, I will carry out this sentence. I will pay for these crimes punish me instead because without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins Jesus said if you need blood take mine and I'll do it for all of humanity for just as the disobedience of one man the many were made sinners through the obedience of one man the many will be made righteous in this courtroom where you've been found guilty you've done it you are guilty you've committed the crimes so you should pay you're told you're free to go Matthew, you're free to go. Courtney, you are free to go. Jesus, I'll see you here on Friday. Your sentence will be carried out then. You and I walk, well, you and I walk away free while Jesus hung on a cross after the flesh was ripped from his back, thorns pushed into his head, 
having been mocked, spat on, unrecognizable by his own mum, the most powerful, powerful person that ever graced the face of this earth, and he could have stopped it at any point, at any time, took all that pain and humiliation for you. Let me tell you, we don't get what we deserve, not at all. And I'm so glad that we don't get what we deserve because if we got what we deserved, we would be in big trouble. Big, big trouble. It would not be good for us. But why did he do it? Why you? Why me? Why would he choose you? Because he doesn't want to spend eternity without you. The band's going to come up as we begin to close. And I just really hope that today you have a better understanding of who you are and what you mean to God. I know how much you mean to God. I want you to know how much you mean to God. And I want you to really grasp it and take strength from it. You know, today people don't know who they are. They try to find their identity in things that aren't God. I identify as this, I identify as that. And over and over and people get confused with their own identity or replace their identity in the material, temporary things that give us confidence, maybe like our looks or our talents or our achievements, but none of that will really matter and it'll all fade into nothing. So take your confidence from who God says you are. And just in case you missed it today, I'm gonna to tell you a couple of things that God says you are. You are the apple of God's eye. I don't mean anyone else, I mean you. You are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Not your neighbor, you. You are loved. You are valuable. You are bought and paid for, and your sins are so far away that they are no longer visible. You shall mount up on wings like eagles. You shall run and not faint. You will walk and not get weary. You are God's precious child. What did we do to deserve it? Nothing. Jesus saved us because that's in his nature. Don't allow yourself to be battered by this world. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside you. Do you believe that? Do you really believe it? That the power that raised Jesus from the dead is inside you. You don't have to live in pain and guilt and shame. Jesus dealt with it. It's done. It is finished. It is done. Jesus has done it all. You are now his child. That's it. Forget all the other stuff. Black, white, this, that. Who cares? You are God's child. That's what it comes down to. Take your identity from that. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that people have an understanding of who they really are. Who they are because of your son, Jesus Christ. I pray that people can live in the confidence and the knowledge that they are the child of the Most High God. We thank, praise, and honor Jesus for his sacrifice. Today, I wanna to give you an opportunity, if you haven't already, to give your life to Jesus. You know, this is the biggest decision any of us will ever make, because it determines where we'll spend eternity. It's a big deal. So I'm gonna say a prayer, and please repeat it after me. You know, everyone in the room's gonna say it along so you don't feel singled out or anything. But remember God loves you and he sent his son to die for you and your sins have been forgiven. Let's pray. Just repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that Jesus came and died for me and rose again. I know that I have broken your laws and I ask you to forgive me for this. From today on, I turn my life to follow you. Teach me how to do life your way. Thank you for your love. Amen. Um, if that's the first time you've prayed that prayer or you've decided to give your life to Jesus today, please talk to someone after the service so we can help you with the next steps. Um, there's a short video um, that will just give you some next things you can do.